Psalms chapter 32, a psalm of David Mishael, and that Mishael is instruction, so it's an instructional song, hymnal. Blesses he, whom trans blesses he whose transgressions is forgiven. Happy is what bless means. Joyful. Listen, it ain't, it ain't going to be a blessed, it ain't going to be a joyful event when your sins are not covered. When they're out in the open. Saved or lost. Listen, if you're lost and your sins are open, you're going to hell. Imagine being a born again Christian, having everybody in the world, not only in your family, but your church, your pastor, your family, your friends, your, your everyone close to you to know what your sins are if they're not under the blood. It'll be a joyful event today, now, to put your sins under the blood. <coughs> Excuse me. Whose sin is covered. It doesn't say washed. Why would it, why would it not say washed? You're in the Old Testament. It says not the not the blood of the bulls and goats, but by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ are you washed. An Old Testament saint, as we're reading now in B.C., would not have his sins covered. He'd be forgiven. The, transgiv the transgivings would be forgiven, but the sins are not covered until Christ finished the work. When he came across that gulf from hell, and marched over there to Abraham's bosom. That's it. It was. It's done. Old Testament and going into the New Testament. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity. And imputed, imputed means to put the charge on. It will be great when the Lord will be able to not charge you iniquity. When, the, when your sins are covered. When your transgressions are, are forgiven. Those are three separate words. Transgressions and sin and iniquity. And transgression is when you cross the line you're not supposed to be doing. Sin to him that knows to do, to him that knows to do good and doeth it not. To him it is sin. is when you violate what God told you. And iniquity is just the worst of all worst that you can do. And in whose spirit there is no guile. Well, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice it says spirit. We're a body, soul, and spirit. And here the spirit is no, is no fault. Every man has a spirit. And that's of God. And when we die, our, that spirit goes back to God. When it goes back to God, it better not have any guile. When you die, your spirit will speak. Now your soul, the body goes into the grave. Your soul goes to heaven or hell. For a saved man, your, your soul and your spirit goes to God. The spirit testifies. If, you go, if you're lost, your spirit goes to God and your soul goes to hell. Your spirit will testify. When I kept silence, what's, what is the reference, what is the, the action, the subject that we're talking about? The transgressions, the sin, the iniquity, the guile. When I kept silent, me when I did not confess my sins, no confession. When I should when I should repent to God, I kept silent. My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Sin will make you old. Sin will get you sore. Sin will, will get you roaring like a lion. Scr uh, your body screaming out. Bones. We, we saw some bones, I believe it was last night. Listen, when your bones hurt, when they get old, they can't support you as, as they when they were young. Sin can have a consequence on your body. They can have a consequence on your soul. 
if you don't put it under the blood. If you don't do what God told you to do. For day and night, thy hand, God's hand, was heavy upon me. Why? Because I kept silent. God will chastise you. Now, God will not chastise a child of Satan. That's not his children. Now, God will, God will judge those who reject Jesus Christ. But that judgment usually ends up in, in hell. But he'll chastise us and get us to do right when we don't put it under the blood. And it says, heavy upon me. It says over in Hebrews uh, 13 that our fathers cor uh, corrected us for a moment of time, but God the Father will correct us heavily. Because he wants us to do right. He wants to reward us. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Selah. Now around that Selah you'll find, again, second advent passage. What's the what is it? My for day and night thy hand was upon me. How about seven day how about seven years? Day and night. Jacob's trouble. God whipping the Jew for rejecting the Messiah. Listen, the tribulation period, the great tribulation period, is, is not the wrath of God upon the Jew, it's a chastisement for not obeying what God told them. I acknowledge my sin. Run that back to verse 2. After God for seven years becomes heavy upon those Jews, the Jews in, the re in, in, in return will acknowledge my sin unto thee, unto God. And my iniquity have I not hid. They're going to confess. God is going to give them a new heart, a new, a new spirit in them. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin, Selah. Run that to Daniel 9, 4 through 15. Well, there's a big big difference between verses 1 and 2. If you do what you're supposed to do, putting your sins on the blood, that's good. Amen. But if you don't, 3 and 4, when you acknowledge your sins in verse 5, well, you know, your life will be upside down from, chapter, from verses 3 and 4. The best thing to do is put your sins under the blood now before God goes after you. That's why this is called a meshil, an instruction. What's the instruction? Put your sins under the blood. Do you realize a Jew who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior today will not suffer the wrath of, of, of uh, the time of Jacob's trouble? Why? Because it's under the blood. And when the church is called out, he'll be called out. This is one of Martin Luther's favorite psalms we're reading. For this shall everyone that is godly pray unto thee in the time when thou mayest be found. Can you picture a time when, when God can't won't be found? Got to be the tribulation. I'm one of the ones that will teach, and whether it's right or wrong, that the Holy Spirit goes when the church goes. Now, a lot of people won't believe that. The Second Thessalonians chapter three or four, they were talking about the wicked, and you read that, and God says, "While he may as be found." What do we read today in, in Revelation? There's going to be a time on this earth when man's going to want death 
and he's not going to get it. And I always preach with that. Can you imagine a guy going on top of the Sears Towers or the World Trade? I well, we can't go World Trade, but go on top of the Empire State Building and do a swan dive in the streets of New York City and get up and still be alive? Can you imagine what kind of pain he's going to be in? And he's not going to be able to die. And then getting bit by those scorpions and the horses, or the horses and scorpion, whatever you want to call them. Listen, God's in control, not science. You know what the mercy of God's lacking at that point? There is no death. I ask you to pray for my teeth and, and things like that. And you know what? There's coming a day that I won't have to worry about my teeth any longer unless, you know, Lord shows me. One day I'm going to die or one day I'm going to be raptured out of here and I'm going to have no more pain and sorrow. But I wonder how long it's going to take those men in tribulation to realize, hey, I won't get death. Surely in the floods of the great waters, they shall not come nigh unto him. What? Death. Sin. Overpowering. Over what, that's the things in the tribulation. One third of the water is going to be blood. One third of the waters are going to be bitterness. One third of the war is going to be destroyed. One third of the men are going to be destroyed, killed. And then the thing is, when you, we're talking about sin in this path, well, what happens if you just mount sin on top of sin on top of sin on top of sin? There's all kinds of troubles in your life and in everybody around you. Alcoholism, alcoholism is a sin that not only do you suffer, but everybody suffers around you. And the more you drink, the more troubles you cause, because the more you're taking from, from the budget, the more you're doing your body in more injustice, and now your body's getting diseases, and now it, it, you're passing it on to your children because they're going to drink. You cause hardship to your wife or your, your husband, whichever the case will be. Then you're not going to work like you're supposed to. And it just gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And the more you drink, the more you're not going to not want to drink. Thou art my hiding place. Well, in the tribulation, where, where is it? That's the wilderness where God tells them to go. What's the hiding place? As far as this chapter, sin. You can go to God to comfort. You want to sin, you go to God and say, God, listen, I don't want to do it. I'm tired of doing it. I don't want to do it this time. And God will take you and put him inside, put you inside his palm and keep you from sin at that moment. You can get victory over your sin. And when you don't, you need to put it under the blood and fight it the next time. It was more better to say, God, I, I can't get the victory and have God fight the battle than having, have, than having to have you put it under the blood because you did it. And the next time you do do it, when you do apply the blood, God will be more forgiving to you, more merciful because you, you fought it before. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. That's God, thou. Sin causes trouble. The tribulation is called Jacob's trouble. Thou shalt compass that surround circle me about with songs of deliverance. Selah. There's that Selah again. We're in the tribulation passage here going into the millennium. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't you think that when Jesus Christ comes, they're going to break out in, in songs? When they see the Antichrist and the false prophet chained, uh, put into hell, and the Satan uh, chained up for a thousand years, you want to talk about singing? The Bible says that there's going to be joyfulness when we're in heaven, when we see Satan and uh, 
Revelation chapter 12, cast out of heaven. That's going to be joy. I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with my eye. After all this forgiving, after all this forsaking of sin, after the tribulation period, God will instruct, God will teach, and God will guide. For the, for the Jew in the tribulation, he's going to tell them exactly where to go. Now, we believe in Salopetra. It may not be. But if you were to go over, let's, let's say the rapture church would happen right now. In seven years, you're going to get to the point of three and a half years, they're going to have to run from the Antichrist. And let's say the, if the rapture would happen within two months, if you were to go over, over to Jerusalem right now and pick out a hundred Jews and say, how do I get the sale of Petra? I wonder how many would answer or could give you an answer. But yet, at the three and a half year period, when, when the Antichrist reveals who he is, they're all going to run to that one place. Now, what if it's not Sailor Petra? How are they going to know where to go? Because God will instruct thee in the way which thou shalt go, and guide thee with my eye. Now, bringing it back to, to a sinner and... God will instruct thee. God puts on every pack of cigarettes exactly what what, what by the by an unsaved person in the United States government tells you what's going to happen if you continue smoking. I believe now they put on, on alcohol cans and bottles that as a result of this you're not to drive, something like that. In the way which thou shalt go. When you go to church, the pastor often tell you where you're to go in your life. Where you're to head. What you're to do. You don't go to church, that's, that's, you're right there in the wrong. You go to church, the Bible given, the, the church is given that we may know, we may be instructed. God says he gives us pastors, gives us teachers, he gives us for the instruction. Uh, Paul writes. I will guide thee with my eye. Be ye not as the horse. Or as the mule. Now we all know the stubbornness of the mule. The horse. What is the horse? Which hath no understanding. So a horse. And a mule has no understanding where man can. Man can get wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Evidently, a horse or a mule cannot get the understanding. What is understanding? Understanding in the Bible is your relationship to a God. A horse does not know how to prance for God. A mule does not know how to carry a heavy load or take you down into a, into a canyon. Like they have over there in the Grand Canyon. They, they don't know how to do that for God. But you ought to know what you're to do for God. Understanding is how you can apply what you know, the wisdom that you have, so you can please God. <clears throat> Whose mouth must be held in with bit and bridle. Least they come near unto thee. You control a horse or a mule by a brit or a bridle that's put into their mouth. <coughs> Excuse me. Even James speaks about it in James chapter 3. You don't need a brit or a bridle. You don't need something put into your mouth. You have the word. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That is your guidance. That's your understanding. God told you that. God is going to guide you. A horse 
or mu is guided by this bri or bridle, where we just learned about instruction in verse eight. But they have no; they don't know why they're doing it. God will give you the understanding. God will tell you why he wants it done. Now, I'm not talking about individual things. What I'm talking about in general is he will reward us with rewards. We will get credit for things that we do. Now, something particular in your life, you may have no idea why God having you do something in your life today. But it works out for his purpose and for your benefit, the judgment seat of Christ, and all eternity. That's one thing for sure. I know of understanding that I'm, I'm doing things today because it will please God. Now, exactly what are the results going to be? I have no idea. We went on the streets today and we hand out gospel tracts. We preach. Brother Chris talked to people. Understand this, we did that for God. Did anybody get saved? We have no idea. As far as we know, no. But what do we know? We didn't see what God did. Many sorrows shall be to the wicked. I'm trying to think if the rich man in hell ever spoke about I know he said torment, being torment. I don't know if you ever spoke about sorrows. Because we know in, Re in Revelation 21, God will wipe away all our tears. There will be no more sorrow. I wonder if there's ever a crying that you can have without tears. Because that, that's probably what will happen in hell. But he that trusts in the Lord. So what definition do we get of wicked? He does not trust in the Lord. So let me ask you a question. Can a Christian be wicked? Answer is yes. You can be saved and not trust the Lord. Go about your own, go about your own way. And not doing what we just said. The instruction, uh, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go, and I will guide thee with my eye. Now, if a saved Christian does not obey God, he is wicked. How would you like to get that? As a new name in glory for all eternity. I believe your name will, will result in your conduct on this earth. People get nicknamed. For something that has happened to them sometime in their life. Sometimes they are who they are. He'll get a nickname Skinny because he's skinny. He gets a nickname, uh, you know, Fats because he's fat. He gets a nickname Red because his hair is red. I think God's going to do the same thing for our Christian conduct. I think a lot of Christians are going to get the glory and they're not going to like their name. But he that trusts in the Lord, mercy shall compass him round about, encircle him. You better believe that your life can be 14 million times worse than it is right now. It's God's mercy. You better thank God that clover oil works right now. That there is a remedy for the pain. Because it could be worse, could be nothing remedy the pain. We forget God's mercy for what he has done for us rather than looking at what is going on in our life present. We are in America. We're not. In, I believe America is going to be a third world country, and I mean by that, I mean no doctors, no houses, living outside, no medical care. Even though we get, we're trying to get this government medical thing, I think this country is going to be just like a third world nation, poor and poverty and no help. You know, there are Christians in the third world country that go through the same troubles that we have, and they don't, ha they don't even have aspirin.
They drink from filthy water. We forget about God's mercy, and that ought not to be so. Even I am guilty of that. Be glad in the Lord. How do you be glad in the Lord? Realize the mercy that God's shown you. And rejoice, ye righteous. Shout for joy. Now let me ask you a question before I end this chapter about churches today. And you get these people that raise their hands and, and clap and do all this stuff in the churches. And they're wicked because they don't do what God tells them to do. How can they be glad? According to verse 11 from 9, 10, and 11. How can they rejoice in verse 11 according to 9 and 10? Because it says, ye righteous. That's someone who, do, who, who does what God tells them to do. That's somebody, according to the whole chapter, put their sins under their blood. There are some people out there that you think they're glad or you think they're rejoicing, and it's just a show. And we're not talking about a church passage here. What David's talking about, listen, to yourselves. When you're all by yourself, are you glad in the Lord? Are you rejoicing? Shout for joy. Do you think rock music for Jesus is, is, is righteous? They're shouting. <coughs> All ye that are upright in heart. I've been in churches where, oh, we're happy, we're rejoicing, and you're not upright in heart because you're not doing what God told you, and you're not righteous. Matter of fact, you're sick, you're putrefying. You match Revelation chapter 3, the Laodicean church age. You make God sick. This chapter tells you you're to put your sins under the blood. If you don't, you're going to get chastised. Then you're going to put them under the blood. This chapter teaches the, the, the Jew in the tribulation coming at the three and a half years running from the Antichrist. Coming to the Messiah knowing who Jesus is. Didn't you read today when we read Revelation that there's going to be Jews from great tribulation that washed their robes white in the blood of Jesus. Wait a minute. Jews who wash their garments in Jesus? That's a lot saying for than what's going on today. If a Jew trusts Jesus Christ as his Savior today, his family will wash him out. And what sin penalty, what the, the penalty of sin, troubles and problems. And that God's guidance comes by obeying and doing what God told you to do. This is a tribulation passage and this is a daily passage that God has given us. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think 
that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul